Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be in London. And uh, well, um, we have people on Twitch. So hi, Twitch. Nice to have you with us today. Uh, it's going to be a nice, uh, nice day. And hopefully, you're going to learn a ton of stuff. So my name is Julian. Uh, I'm the uh, AI evangelist for EMEA. Uh, I've been with AWS for about two and a half years now. And uh, <laughs> prior to that, I've been a CTO, VP engineering, that sort of thing, for uh, about uh, 10 years, more than 10 years, uh, in uh, pretty big startups in Paris. Yeah, so I'm French, but I'm actually one of the nicer ones, OK? <laughs> so be friendly, and I will, all right? Uh, and hopefully, I can go home tonight, because as you may know, there's a, probably a, a foot of snow in Paris at the moment. So it's going to be an interesting ride tonight. Anyway, we're going to enjoy the day. And uh, you're in the AI track. Um, and well, I'm happy to do a, a lot of sessions today. So hopefully, you won't get too tired of me. Uh, we'll look at the, at the program in a second. <coughs> Before we start, uh, I would like to thank Intel uh, for uh, it's a small company. They, you know, they're going to be something one day. Um, they're sponsoring uh, this track and the event. Uh, and they are providing some <coughs> chips as well that you know, we tend to use for machine learning and deep learning. So thank you, Intel. Keep them coming. So today, uh, here's, the, here's the program. So um, uh, this is the first session. It will be an overview of uh, AI and machine learning on AWS. We call it the State of the Union. Uh, then we'll uh, dive a little deeper into deep learning and start to see some code. There will be a lot of code today, so don't worry. It's not only slides, lots of demos. Um, and we're going to look at deep learning in general, and, and uh, we're going to look at uh, MXNet, which is one of the open source libraries for deep learning that we tend to like. And we'll look at some other things. Uh, then I, I will have a much needed break, uh, but you will keep working, because uh, Ian is going to talk to you about chatbots. Right? He's got a really, really great session on chatbots. So make sure you hang around for that one. Um, then hopefully we'll have lunch, and, uh, and uh, after lunch, we'll resume with uh, another technical session on uh, one of the newer services called SageMaker. Uh, probably uh, some of you have heard about it or even tried it. SageMaker is a great tool to build end-to-end -end machine learning workflows on AWS, on managed infrastructure. Okay, and we will show you a lot of demos again on this one. And if the demo gods are with me, uh, we'll finish the day uh, with a session on uh, Deep Lens, right? Uh, Deep Lens is a, is a deep learning camera that was announced at reInvent. And uh, it's a great tool for developers to learn about deep learning and to experiment. OK, so hopefully it'll work. If not, you know, I'll figure it out. And I've got enough content to last for a week, so no big deal. <laughs> All right? Um, if you guys have questions, I'm, I'm happy to take questions during the session, um, right? That's, uh, that's fine. Uh, if you guys have questions on Twitch, please ask your questions. We have uh, uh, colleagues uh, moderating Twitch, so uh, they should be able to answer most of your questions. And, you know, if your questions are really, really good, they might even send them to me, right? So, uh, so fire away, okay? Um, so let's get started, right? So... Why are we even talking about this, right? Why, why is Amazon uh, worthy <laughs> of you know, saying stuff on AI? That's a, it's a fair question. Uh, well, I guess you know, you're quite familiar with that tiny website called Amazon.com. It's like Intel. You know, it's probably going to become something one day. And uh, well, it's been around for a while. And uh, it's pretty obvious when you use it that there is machine learning on every single page. And actually, there is more than one model everywhere, right? from content personalization to product recommendation to uh, uh, self-service support, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the only way you can run a website as big as Amazon.com at, at this scale is by automating everything, right? By using machine learning everywhere. And so it's visible on the website, but it's also visible on, uh, I would say, on the back-end side, right? Uh, probably you've heard about those uh, robots, the Amazon Robotics robot, um, that uh, uh, literally move around in, uh, in the fulfillment centers, carrying the shelves automatically to the picking teams, right? So saving time for everybody, allowing us to uh, get your orders through the door quicker. Um, of course, this, is all, this, has been, this has been running for a while, and 
as you can imagine, there is a ton of machine learning in there. Um, we also published uh, recently, probably last year, a nice summary on a uh, recommendation at Amazon. It's, uh, you can find that paper on the, on the web. It's pretty cool. And it, it, it goes back uh, you know, all the way to the early days of recommendation up to the latest uh, um, enhancements. So pretty cool stuff. Of course, well, you're lucky in the UK to have the uh, Echo devices, right? You can buy them literally everywhere. And uh, the world is jealous, I can tell you. Everywhere I go, people ask me, where do we get the Echo? It's like, yeah. Next time you go to London or Berlin, you can buy one. Uh, but you have to wait elsewhere, right? So this thing can do natural language processing. It can do uh, uh, <coughs> text-to-speech, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, all that stuff is based on machine learning and deep learning running in the AWS cloud. Uh, plus, you know, it's not only about the Echo. Uh, we have some more devices uh, like the, the Fire TV and the, the Kindle. Uh, and, uh, and the tablets, etc. And all of these, at some point, use one form or the other uh, of, of machine learning. Plus the drones. Uh, people thought it was a joke. Uh, it, you know, it was April's Fool or something. Well, it's not. It's for real. And, well, as you can imagine, this is also using a lot of AI technology. Uh, and the last one I want to point out is uh, Amazon Go. And this just made the news maybe a week or so ago. Because now it's open to the public. It's a, uh, it's a grocery store, or should I say convenience store? You know what I mean, uh, depending on where you're from. Uh, it's in Seattle. And well, the best way to describe it is you, you just go in there, you pick stuff, and, and you leave, right? And you don't, there is no cashier. You, there is no line. You just walk out, literally walk out with your stuff. And you get your bill a few minutes later, right? So this has been. Uh, in the test phase for a while. And now, uh, next time you're in Seattle, you can actually go and buy some chocolate or something. All right? And, uh, well, this is all based on AI tech as well. So just a few examples of uh, Amazon building and applying machine learning and deep learning at scale for a while now. So when it comes to AWS, uh, our mission is to, um, to build on top of this experience and to bring some of this technology to literally everybody, right? So our, our goal is not to say, hey, you know, we're the machine learning experts, so give us a lot of money and we'll build uh, systems for you, right? We, as usual on AWS, we build services, we build Lego bricks that are easy to use and that you can combine to build your own apps, but you do it, right? And everyone in this room can do it, okay? As you will see today, if you can read and write 50 lines of Python code, you can do deep learning, right? Who can read or write 50 lines of Python? <laughs> Come on. Don't be shy. OK. You can learn Python in a day, right? So right? you can write bad Python like me in a day. No worries. So everybody in this room can do it. Don't, don't, be, don't feel shy. You'll see, right? So that's our goal. Put this into your hands and let you build cool stuff. So when it comes to, uh, to the stack, um, we have three levels, and we're going to cover all three levels today. We have a high level that we call application services, which are really APIs, OK? AWS is just a bunch of APIs anyway, OK? It's infrastructure and APIs. That's all there is. That's my definition of cloud computing. And it applies to AI as well. So um, these services let you do image recognition, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, machine translation, et cetera, OK? And they're super easy to use, just literally one or two lines of code. If you need to build your own models, train on your own data, right, you can go down one level and use the platform services. And SageMaker, that we'll cover later today, is one of those, OK? But it's not because you went down one level that it really gets complicated. It can still be fairly easy to use thanks to uh, built-in algorithms, for example, where you can literally take off-the-shelf machine learning algos and apply them to your own data. Or you can go really complicated and build everything as well. Okay? And at the lower level, well, this is probably you know, a little more involved, uh, maybe more you know, for experts, but it's, it's possible too. Uh, using any of the uh, deep learning libraries like uh, MXNet and TensorFlow, Cafe, PyTorch, et cetera, 
uh, running on, uh, on AWS infrastructure, uh, CPU instances from Intel, or GPU instances using the latest NVIDIA GPUs, you can build and train your models and deploy uh, your models at scale uh, on you know, unlimited data sets, really. And the cool thing is that, uh, well, we're happy to have a ton of customers, right? We, uh, we do everything for the customers. As you know, our, our roadmap um, is 90 plus percent driven by customer feedback and customer requests. So, so these services that you're gonna learn about today, we didn't invent them, right, out of the blue. They came out of thousands and thousands of discussions with customers and potential customers who, tell, who told us what kind of problems they were facing and how they would like us to help them solve them, okay? So uh, we'll give you some examples as we go, but uh, you know, we think we have more customer references than everybody out there, okay? And this is just a small list. So let's start with the high-level services. So the first one I want to talk about is called recognition with a K. Um, and this one is about visual content, okay? So this came out at reInvent 2016, so over a year ago. And uh, the first features that we released were uh, analyzing images, right? So you can do object detection, trying to figure out what's in an image. You can do uh, facial analysis, detect faces and, and facial attributes. Uh, you can do face comparison. You can do celebrity recognition. And you can do image moderation. So let's look at a few quick examples here. So scene detection is pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, pass an image to an API. It could be passed in line or it could be stored in S3. And in real time, you get some labels and some confidence scores. Okay? So that's just an example. Uh, what you really get is a... It's a JSON document with you know, labels and, and confidence scores, okay? And this has been trained on a pretty deep uh, data set. So, uh, you know, you have a, a few labels in there. The next feature is facial, facial analysis. So finding faces in pictures and finding attributes for those faces, okay? Uh, so you also get the coordinates, you know, the bounding box around the face. You get the location of uh, landmarks, you know, eyes, nose, mouth, etc. Uh, age range, gender, uh, emotion, uh, and a few more things, all right? So uh, it's not about single pictures. Here's an actual picture taken by one of my colleagues at a meetup in India, it looks like it. And, uh, and as you can see, we can detect a whole lot of people in there. We can detect up to 100 people in the same picture, okay? And that limit is pretty much arbitrary to guarantee uh, uh, real-time response times, okay? And as you can see, we can you know, find the faces and the eyes and the nose, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, you can do face comparison. Okay, so you could take two pictures and compare old pictures uh, two by two. Oh, yeah, take, t take old pairs and compare them. Um, and and you know, have a good uh, similarity between those faces. Um, you can build face collections as well. So we could take a picture of everybody in this room, build a collection, and then uh, <coughs> take any picture again and say, okay, is, is this person in the collection or not, right? So as you can imagine, this could apply to a whole lot of security applications, you know, airport check-ins and, and whatnot, saving me time all week. Hopefully they'll do that. Image moderation is super important if you have a website um, and uh, user-generated content. So uh, you can detect um, suggestive content or Explicit content, but I will not demo it today. You can try that on your own. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that this service, is just, it, it just gives you an indication, right? In some cultures, in some contexts, this picture could be completely acceptable, right? Imagine it's a, it's a fashion magazine, right? Okay, so this is cool. You can, you can accept that. Um, in other parts of the world or in other contexts, you know, it might not be acceptable, even though you know, there's nothing shocking with this picture, to, to me at least. So you, you get the scores, and then depending on your context and your sensitivity, you can decide <laughs> if it's acceptable or not. Uh, we can do celebrity recognition. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, artists and, uh, and, uh, and people from sports and uh, politicians and you know, well, famous people in general. Uh, and uh, we're able to detect them. Um, and I tried it on some of my favorite 
heavy metal bands, and some of them pretty obscure, and yes, they're in there. So uh, that's a good metric, right? Uh, and one of my favorite games is, you know, think of someone we should probably remember, uh, detect, and, uh, and see if it works. So we don't have time for this today, but last time we tried the, uh, the football team from Uzbekistan, right? <laughs> and, uh, and it got eight people out of 11, right? Correct. So I was impressed, right? Pretty good. And then they asked me with the, for the Russian curling team, and we got none, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so no curling players in there, sorry. Another feature that's, that was announced recently is we call it text in the image. So this lets you detect text in images, as you would expect. And um, so you get the actual text strings, uh, and you get the bounding boxes for each word and each sentence. Okay? So depending on uh, what you want to do, uh, you can get uh, word level information or uh, sentence level information. Yeah, let me mute this. All right. Okay, so in general, this is how the service work uh, and how the uh, other high level service work. It's just, this is a CLI example. Uh, you could do the exact same thing using one of the SDKs, right? I think we have 10 or 11 languages now. Uh, and here we pass an image stored in an S3 bucket and we get some, uh, some confidence scores, right, and labels. Okay, uh, detecting faces works pretty much the same. And this time you get the bounding box and the landmark locations and all the attributes, okay? So, you know, it's all good fun, but this is actually used for very serious stuff. Um, we have a customer called Marinus Analytics. It's a US company, and they build, uh, they build solutions for law enforcement, okay? And in this specific case, they built a tool and a platform that helps find missing children. So they get pictures of... Um, um, missing kids, right? Uh, they build a database, a face collection, like I said earlier, and then they go and crawl the ugliest places on the web, and they try to find those kids again, right? And, uh, well, the good thing is that it works, uh, and they can, uh, they successfully, uh, the, the first, actually the first week they put this in production, they found kids already and sent the law enforcement to, uh, to go and rescue them. So, you know, this is, a lot of AI can seem, you know, funny and, uh, and just sometimes a little silly. And yes, you can do silly stuff. Uh, but when you apply this technology to, you know, uh, important uh, causes like this one, uh, it, it makes things possible. And that's, that's really a thread, a common thread when you talk about AI. Um, it, it, makes, uh, yeah, it makes hard problems uh, disappear, right? If you had to look for three kids on two websites, you know, we could do this five times a day, right, manually. When you start looking for thousands or tens of thousands of kids on potentially millions of websites, then, you know, you could put 4,000 police officers, they would not be able to do that, that job, right, all day long. So AI is really about scaling humans, right? Helping humans process uh, visual content, text content, um, a voice content at scale automatically, right? It's a, you, you, we'll, we'll see that a lot today. Uh, we extended that service to video, and yeah, it's called a recognition video, good name. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing, except this time you do it with video, <coughs> right? So you can still do label detection and face detection, etc., but you can do it on video, uh, on video data, okay? So actually you can do this on uh, video archives, or you can do this on uh, streams, okay? And uh, probably the best way to do this would be to use another service that was launched at reInvent called Kinesis Video Streams, um, which is an extension of Kinesis, right? Our, uh, our real-time scalable messaging service for video data, all right? Uh, so you can do, like, as you see here, uh, you can do the same things as with recognition for images. Um, the extra thing that you can do here is one of them is activity detection. So since we have the, the time dimension, we can see people moving, running, playing guitar, you know, cooking, whatever it is, right? We can, it's easier to, to understand what they're really doing. And we can do tracking, okay? So uh, we can do object tracking and we can do person tracking. So if, uh, if you have a video where 
you know, uh, let's say your face appears for 20 seconds, and then, you know, something else happens, and then you show up again for 20 seconds, recognition is going to say, well, that's the same person, right? So if you're a celebrity, it's going to say, hey, here's uh, Elon Musk again, or, um, right? Or, or if you're just a regular Joe like me, it's going to say, well, that's person 28 again, right? So I'm not a number, but to a recognition, I think we're all numbers for now, until we're celebrities. <laughs> all right, so you can play uh, with this service in the console, so you can upload short videos and, uh, and have them analyzed, and, and you get labels, and you get potentially celebrities, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, that's an example of detecting a person, right? So you can, as you can see, it could be a very fuzzy face. <laughs> And, uh, and recognition is still able to say, hey, there's a proper person in there, right? Uh, and again, we would be able to find that same person over and over again uh, across the same video, okay? Um, APIs are just uh, what you'd expect, right? Um, <coughs> here, just detect, on, uh, detect labels and on, a, on a video stored in S3, okay? <coughs> So just start the job and then wait for a bit and then query the results and, and get, uh, get the, the information out there. So customers for this, well, I think it's, to me it's pretty obvious. Uh, any kind of, I would say, um, real-time monitoring, uh, you know, security applications, trying to understand what's happening in real-time in multiple locations. So Motorola is building those solutions, video, real-time video analysis for you know, law enforcement and, uh, and other organizations. And uh, the city of Orlando is actually using this to monitor what's happening on the street, right? So you could count cars, you, know, you could monitor traffic, um, you could be looking for missing persons, you could be looking for uh, persons of interest, which is a polite way to say criminals. Um, you could do a whole kind of things, right? And uh, the interesting thing is that you probably can do it with the existing infrastructure, okay? You could grab the video streams coming from the existing cameras and uh, send them to Kinesis and, and then into recognition, right? So you could leverage existing infrastructure and existing hardware to do this. You don't need specific cameras, right? You don't need to fix the existing infrastructure. Um, plus, I would say, Everybody who has a large collection of video files, uh, TV channels, um, all the you know, uh, movie studios, uh, content producers, right, who have petabytes and petabytes and petabytes of video data and who want to find uh, quickly um, a, a clip or a specific position in, in an archive where this is happening, right? And, uh, and this is a pretty difficult Thing to do usually. So now you could just index everything, take the metadata coming out of recognition, put that in a database somewhere. It's not going to be a ton of data, right? So it's easy to index, index, easy to query, and and you can access your petabytes of video files, and uh, and get some uh, get some results, right? Pretty cool. Okay, so this is it for images and videos. So recognition is is what you should look at, and uh, it's a, it's a really easy service to use. Try it out. Um, poly. Uh, poly is text-to-speech, right? And, well, I don't have to explain why it's called poly here, right? You get it, okay? No, no one else does, but in the UK you do, right? <laughs> so, so, so US. The, the funny thing is this was, uh, this was developed by uh, 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 one of our development centers in Poland, right? So they didn't want to call it Polish, but okay. <laughs> I'm guessing that's the reason. So good name, actually. It's a, like a dual meaning thing. Um, so poly is text to speech. Okay, so that's easy to understand. <coughs> Take a text string in one of uh, 25 languages. Uh, select a voice. We have 50 voices today, so men and women, right? Multiple uh, voices for the same language. Uh, call an API, and in real time you get a sound file. Okay, so it's as easy as this. Okay, uh, you can also use SSML, uh, which is a markup language, to, uh, to um, modify 
the, the output, right, from, from poly. So you could, you could change the speed, you could change the pitch. So you can play on, uh, you can influence what we call the prosody, right, the way the text is spoken. You can also um, give specific instructions on how you want, for example, dates or numbers, uh, phone numbers, to be, to be spoken. Okay, so for example, phone numbers, you know, sometimes it's easier to say, you know, my phone number is, you know, triple eight five five double two, you know, that kind of thing, versus saying eight 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 five five. Okay, so dates, uh, you know, room numbers, all, all kinds of numbers. You know, you, you would like to have them spoken in a very specific way, and, and you can you can do that with SSML. You can also add uh, specific uh, 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 pronunciations. So, for example, you know. Uh, family names or, or first names or product names or company names. You know, maybe Polly is not going to pronounce them exactly the way you want, right? So you could actually upload uh, a, a phoneme, so the phonetic uh, pronunciation for this, this word, and say, okay, this word, this is exactly how you should speak it, right? So that allows you to customize pronunciation. Again, a very simple API. Uh, probably one of the simplest AWS services. Uh, the main one is called Synthesize Speech. So text string, voice, and they have names. Uh, and of course, the UK male voice is called Brian, right? It, it had to be called Brian. Uh, Joanna, I think, is one of the US voices, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, and the, the output format, right, which could be MP3 or, uh, or OG or something else, I don't remember. Um, and you get your sound file, okay? Easy. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, a customer using this, um, it's called Duolingo. Probably you're familiar with Duolingo, they're well known. Um, so it's an app that lets you learn foreign languages, okay? And uh, if you ever tried it, it's, it's very, very, um, 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 it's, it's really, it focuses on, you know, practicing immediately. So you don't learn grammar and, and all the boring stuff. You start to practice immediately. And, and so um, the app is going gonna, is gonna to speak to you literally the minute you start using it. Okay? And they found that the quality of the voice that you hear is super important in, in your learning experience. So if, uh, if you have a very high quality voice with a, the right accent and just a, a human sounding voice, you learn better. They actually run A-B tests using different voices, different voice providers, and they found out that Polly was the voice that got uh, students uh, uh, more involved and that helped students get uh, better results, learning faster. Okay, so that's an interesting result. The, the voice that you hear is actually helping you learn better. And Polly was the number one voice here. Um, here's another example. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple when you think of it, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> application. Um, the Washington Post uh, is, is integrating Polly in their mobile app to uh, basically let the app read the articles to you, right? So you don't have to walk like this in the street and get hit by a black cab. Especially since they're driving on the wrong side of the street, which is a persisting problem in the UK. You've got to fix this, right? It's dangerous, really dangerous for me, right? So you don't have to be distracted. You could just leave your phone in your pocket and listen to that, okay? Uh, another example I could give you, um, it's, uh, it's an Indian company called Haptic. And uh, they build a personal assistant app, right? So you can define reminders, okay? So you could define a reminder in the app saying, okay, uh, Remind me to uh, catch my Eurostar tonight at 7.30, right? Fine. And actually, instead of popping up a notification like all the other apps do, right, and we tend to ignore them because they're so intrusive after a while, you will get a phone call, okay? Because you will get a proper phone call from the app with a poly-generated message telling you, hey, you know, you should run to St. Pancras and catch the Eurostar at 7.30. And, uh, and this is generated with Polly. I think it's pretty clever because we probably tend to ignore phone calls less that we, than we tend to ignore 
uh, notifications. Although some of my colleagues would say that I tend to ignore everything. But my excuse is I'm traveling so much. Okay, but here's another example, haptic. There are plenty of simple use cases like that. Uh, all the poly use cases, when you read them, you go, oh yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. Why didn't anybody think about that? Okay, another one. This one came out at reInvent. Uh, it's uh, still in preview, but you can join the, the preview and, and start using it. It's called Translate, and well, it does translate. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, so this is exactly what you'd expect. Pick a text string and uh, translate it in a different language, right? Simple, as simple as it gets. So this is real time. Um, this is based on deep learning technology. Uh, actually, a while ago, uh, we released an open source project called uh, Sockeye. Uh, you can find that on GitHub. And Sockeye uh, is, uh, is based on, uh, on deep learning models. And you can train your own models and build your own uh, language pairs if you want to. And this was used as the foundation to build this high-level service. Okay, same technology. So today, Translate supports 12 language pairs. So you can translate from English to uh, uh, French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, and Arabic. Yeah, that's six. Or from one of those back to English. Okay, uh, so of course we will add more language pairs, um, but these are the ones you can start with today. And like I said, if you need uh, Swedish to Ukrainian, um, you, m my advice would be go take a look at Sakai uh, and actually SageMaker will also make your life easier. I'll talk about that. Uh, grab data sets for those languages and train your models. Okay, same technology. So. It does work exactly the way you would think, right? So um, text string, source language, target language, boom, right? Simple. So who are the customers for this? Um, well, I would tend to say everybody, because who doesn't have <laughs> uh, content to translate, but specifically uh, people who run uh, international websites in multiple languages uh, tend to have this problem a lot. So Amazon.com, I'm sure, is, uh, uh, is using automatic tools for translation. I don't see anyone translating uh, product pages on Amazon into a zillion languages. And uh, Hotels.com, um, they, uh, they have almost 100 different websites in 40 plus languages. So that's a big problem for them, right? And it's very dynamic content. Okay, it's, it changes a lot. So there's no way you can keep up. There's no way you can justify the cost of paying people to translate everything all the time. So, uh, so either you leave everything in English, you know, which is a problem in many markets, or, uh, or you use automated tools. And they're using Translate uh, to make that uh, job simpler. Uh, Isencia uh, is, is uh, also a good example of, uh, of uh, Translate customers. These guys do uh, media intelligence. So th their customers are uh, brands, basically. And they monitor uh, what people say about this brand, what media uh, say about this brand all over the world. Okay? So imagine you're, uh, you know, imagine you're Amazon, and you want to know what, what is being published on Amazon in newspapers all over the world. Well, guess what? It's not all going to be in English, right? That could be a shock to some people, but no, not to us, right? And, uh, and of course, you need to translate that stuff automatically, understand what it says, and, and, and build some reports, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have vast amount of documents, vast amounts of data in many languages, and you need to automatically process that, of course, translate is going to be a good option. Sure. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so that here, the translation that you're talking about, is it just from uh, text to audio, or can we do the translation from audio to audio? OK, so the question is, uh, so this is text to text. Oh, text to text. OK, so the translation is text to text. OK, but uh, um, there's another service. You saw my slides. <laughs> Didn't you? I know. There's another service I'm going to talk about in a minute that does uh, speech to text. OK, Polly does text to speech. OK, uh, Translate does text to text, but there's a one called Transcribe 
that does uh, speech to text. So of course the game will be to combine everything afterwards, right? Yes. One question I had is uh, based on the last slide, do you have input language detection or do you have to specify the input language? Uh, no, you, you, have, uh, you have language detection. Yeah, you have language detection. So actually you could ignore that source language thing and uh, especially since we only support six languages at the moment, it's fairly easy, right? Uh, when you have to detect from 100 languages, it's more complicated. Okay. Yes, sir. Shall I leave it to the end? Or no, uh, fire away. No, no, no. You're not disturbing. I'm okay, here to uh, answer your questions. Can, uh, can it handle ages? So, um, say you've got a picture yep. of, um, and of, the, of the time. Yep. So, the question is does recognition handle aging? Uh, so, the answer is no. Uh, it, it, you just pass that picture, and we're going to look for that. But actually, it's an interesting question. There's, uh, there's another AWS customer called Thorn. And they do something similar to Marinus Analytics. They, they're a nonprofit organization. And they're, again, they're trying to fight you know, uh, uh, sex trafficking, et cetera. And, uh, and they worked uh, with an AWS partner called MemSQL. And those guys built uh, a deep learning platform that does handle aging. Okay, So they have a custom solution where you would give the picture of a missing kid aged 10, right? And let's say that kid disappeared five years ago. So now the kid would be 15. Of course, as we know, you know, kids, you know, we don't change over the years, right? Especially me. But kids do, right? So uh, Thorne is going to age that picture into a 15-year-old kid, and they're going to look for it on the web. What about facial morphs? So for example, if that, if that face you know, was, was, used to be traditionally shaved or whatever, and it's grown a beard now. No, uh, it, you, you can't do that. For now, it's really static images, but these are all interesting ideas. So maybe later. <laughs> yes? Uh, on the face, the recognition, can it work on identical trees? Um, <laughs> I haven't tried it. Do we have twins in the room? <laughs> Let's try it. Um, the, the, the thing about AI, right, it's a, it's, a, the, the, it's a very valid question, and I don't have the answer. I just have an intuition on that, okay? But the thing with AI is that it's not going to be any more clever than humans, okay? So if a human cannot tell the difference between you and your identical twin, AI is not going to do it, okay? So to me, people think AI is kind of dark magic, and, you know, it's like you wave your hands and, you know, crazy stuff happens. So, yeah, some, there is some crazy stuff happening for sure. But to me, the, 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 the bottom line is, if, and it's the case for machine learning in general, right, is that if, if a human can look at the data and come up with a reliable conclusion, you can probably build a machine learning model, okay? If a, if a human cannot, on a small data set, figure it out, then probably uh, it's not, you know, it's not going to work very well with machine learning and deep learning. Was okay. the performance limitation on the video processing? You can do real-time streams. Uh, Kinesis will scale to the sky, so no, no problem there. Right. Okay. It's fully managed. Recognition is fully managed. So, you know, maybe you need to raise your service limits, right? As always in AWS, you know, you have service limits to prevent you from doing silly stuff. That's the diplomatic way <laughs> to put it, right? And then have a million dollar bill, right? And, and, and be surprised. So if you raise the service limits, uh, you, can, you can scale to the sky. There's no, no worries there. Oh yeah, so the question was, sorry about that. So the question was uh, any performance limits on Kinesis and, uh, and Kinesis <coughs> video and recognition video. So no, these are fully managed, so just fire away, right? Yeah. So the question is, how literal is the translation in translate? And can you, uh, can you influence the translation? So um, I'm sure you could come up with counterexamples. But when the service came out uh, and I tried it, you know, and I, I tried to put myself in your shoes. You know, I was an AWS customer before. Maybe I'll be an AWS customer again. Who knows? Uh, but I'm, I tried to put myself in your shoes. So I said, OK, how good is this, right? So um, I grabbed uh, a web page, a random web page from the AWS website in English, translated it to French, okay, uh, my native language, and I read it, and 
it, it was quite good. And uh, honestly, I, I think it would have been okay to grab this and publish it directly on the, on the website. So the fact that this is based on deep learning, right, um, and, uh, and a um, deep learning network called LSTM, we'll talk about that later, it, it gives it, um, it helps it get a lot of context. So it's not going to be word for word translation. It's not, it's not mechanical like that, okay? So if you, have a, if you have a large data set, if you have a varied data set, it's going to pick up a lot of nuances and it's going to use different words for uh, different contexts, okay? So sure, um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't speak Chinese or Arabic, so I couldn't vouch for that. But uh, I, I would say for French, it was pretty good, right? Yeah, and sometimes it does get stuff wrong. <laughs> so, you know, but like any translation system, sometimes it does get it wrong. But the thing is, you know, if imagine you have 10,000 pages to translate, you could definitely translate all of it with uh, Amazon Translate, and then just have someone go through it and proofread it, right? Uh, and that's a massive time saving. So sometimes translation will be production ready, right? Sometimes you're using specific vocabulary or specific names that translate doesn't yet get perfectly right, but you can just easily fix it. So it's, it's just accelerating, right? And we're trying to get to as perfect as we can, of course. The models keep improving as we go. Yeah, maybe one last and then I have to continue, yeah. Does the text in image recognize handwriting? So the question is, does text in image recognize handwriting? Uh, <laughs> I would say it depends how bad your handwriting is. <laughs> Mine doesn't really work. Uh, if you use, you know, if you use like capital letters and, you know, like block letters, etc., it, I tried it, it works pretty good, right? Uh, if you, if it's really, you know, handwriting, uh, uh, then no, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. But, um, I tried it on some pretty exotic, you know, uh, fonts and billboards and book covers, etc., and it was surprisingly fine, you know? So once again, Sometimes one character will be wrong, and that would be easy to correct with a, a spelling checker or something. Um, but the thing is, if you have one million images, right, no one's going to look at one million images and type the text. So you can just go through them, check the results, and again, you could automate that with spell checking and say, okay, maybe 1% are, are weird and someone needs to look at them, but at least you save a massive amount of time, right? So it's all about scaling and saving your time. All right? So transcribe, we were just talking about this. So transcribe is the reverse operation, the reverse service from poly, okay? So it's uh, speech to text. So you take audio clips, uh, and the service is in preview. At the moment, we support English and Spanish. Uh, you pass that to transcribe, and you get text. So it's, on, it's not only text, uh, you get time codes, Okay, so you know exactly when a specific sentence uh, has been spoken. Timestamps. Uh, you can recognize multiple speakers. So we could say, okay, this is a three-person conversation, right? We, we know when uh, uh, speakers are changing. And uh, an important feature is that this works with pretty low-quality audio, right? It works from 8 kilohertz to 44 kilohertz. So 44 is CD quality, so very good quality. 8 kilohertz is phone, qu phone quality, okay? And that's especially important because a uh, main application of this is to uh, automate the transcription of uh, call center uh, discussions, right? Any kind of phone discussion that you want to, uh, trans you want to transcribe and archive and run al analytics on, okay? Um, so again, uh, customers for this. Everybody building call center and, and I would say voice technology is going to need this, right? Uh, be able to put automatically into text whatever has been spoken. Okay, so uh, companies <coughs> like Ring DNA do that. And again, here comes uh, uh, Isencia again, because like I said, they monitor uh, whatever people say about your brand all over the world. So some of it is going to be print media, and some of it is going to be maybe radio media or TV media, and yes, you need to put that into text as well, okay? Right, so again, as you can see, it's all about scaling, right? No one's gonna watch uh, 500 channels all over the world waiting for something to be said about Amazon or, or your own company, right? That doesn't make sense, okay? It can't work like that. So you have to have 
automated systems uh, recording and transcribing text automatically and then detecting that, oh, somebody said something about Amazon or your company. Okay. Which brings me to another service called Comprehend. Uh, Comprehend is about understanding what's actually in the text. Okay? So we saw how to translate it. We saw how to uh, convert speech to text. Now, what does that thing really say? Okay? And Compre you're going to use Comprehend in two different ways. You're going to use it for single documents. So let's say you know, it could be a web page. It could be a tweet. It could be a product review. It could be a customer email. You know, just one document, and you want to know what's in there. Okay? So what are the entities? Um, so what, what persons are mentioned, what organizations are mentioned, uh, key phrases, you know, what are the important bits, what language this is in, right? We, somebody asked the question, and this, is a, can actu this can actually detect 100 languages. So uh, if you want to play with this, just grab some tweets in, uh, in uh, rare languages, right? That's a good game to play on Twitter. Try to find the least frequent languages in there. <laughs> Right? So I'll let you come up with your own examples and, uh, and try and, and see if uh, Comprehend successfully detects that. And a tweet is, is pretty short, right? So sometimes it's just eight, nine words. So it might be difficult to know exactly what language this is. Right? For example, the difference between Russian and Ukrainian right, is pretty subtle. And I tried it, and it works OK. All right? And of course, you have sentiment analysis. Is this positive, negative, or mixed? OK, so that's one way of using it. OK? But Probably the more interesting way is to do topic modeling. So topic modeling means from a huge data set, think you know, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of documents, I want to build two things. I want to build a list of topics, and I want to score each document against this list of topics. Okay? So what's a topic? Well, a topic, it's a collection of words that are related. Okay? And some words might be more important than others, but those words still, you know, they gang together to define what a topic is. So if we had a, let's say, a stock market topic, probably the words would be revenue, quarter, uh, earnings, uh, I don't know, CFO, <laughs> right? that kind of thing, okay? So Comprehend is going to detect that automatically. It's going to detect what clusters of words uh, are actually relevant and it's going to output that first, and then it's going to score each document against the topics. Okay? So it's going to say, well, document uh, uh, number uh, 359 uh, scores 30% you know, on the uh, stock market topic and 20% uh, on the uh, technology topic. So, okay, so you can, you can know this, is, this document is probably uh, talking about you know, Silicon Valley uh, reporting, a company in the Silicon Valley reporting results. Yeah? Uh, no, it's it's completely uh, it's completely unsupervised. Okay, so uh, you literally you just put your data, your documents in S3, right, and you let Comprehend uh, work on that. Okay, no, fully unsupervised. Um, this is so you can do this with Comprehend. Uh, this is based on an algo called LDA, um, and it's actually one of the built-in algorithms in SageMaker. So if you want to build your own version, right. Uh, you can do that on SageMaker too. Okay. So uh, here's a quick example. This is how you would use this on a in the console on a simple uh, on a single document. Okay. Um, and as you can see, we were able to detect uh, you know organizations and persons and quantities and dates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. So that's the visual uh, display of this. Of course, you would get a JSON document if you call the API, right? And topic modeling, okay, this is not a really visual demo, but it's a, it's a simple console. Basically, you define a job, point, uh, comprehend to your data in S3, let it crunch for a bit, and then the output is two CSV files, one with the topics, right, and the words and the relative weights in each topic, and one with the list of documents being scored against the top topics. Okay, so very easy to use. All right, uh, so yeah, you can do a sentiment detection with the API. It's very, very easy. Customers for this, um, well, Hotels.com and Isense, yeah, they sure love the new services. 
<laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, but literally everybody who has a ton of uh, text data, which could be you know articles for the Washington Post, they've been around for a while, right? So looking in potentially decades, if not centuries, of archives uh, is going to be simpler with a service like that. Uh, in four, uh, you know, a very large ERP company. Of course, uh, you're going to store tons of documents in, in their solutions, uh, and, and you want to be able to run analytics, text analytics on that. Plus, you know, the website crowd, obviously, uh, for uh, uh, product reviews uh, and, and social networks, et cetera, et cetera. OK, uh, Lex. So I'll, I'll go really quick on that one, because we have a full session uh, by uh, Ian later on. Lex is about chatbots, right? Uh, so you can define um, chatbots. And a chatbot is really it's a conversation. And you literally, as Ian will show you, you define the conversation with no programming at all. Just define the questions and the answers. And uh, you need to have a piece of code in the form of a Lambda function to actually fulfill the operation. Uh, and once the bot is built, you can deploy it to your own apps, mobile, web, etc. And we have also connectors for uh, enterprise applications like Salesforce, Marketo, etc. Okay, so um, Ian will tell you whole more about that and show you how it works. So quickly, let's go through the platform services. Uh, again, I'll go pretty quick here because we're going to have a full session on SageMaker. Uh, so one of them is EMR, right? Elastic MapReduce. Um, it's the, uh, the managed environment for uh, Hadoop <coughs> apps. So you can run Rap MapReduce and Spark, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so sure, you could use Spark and, uh, and the Spark ML library. But how does that really relate to machine learning? Well, AI, well, deep learning and machine learning uh, involve a lot of data preparation, right? And that's usually most of the work is data preparation. So when you need to do this at scale, when you need to clean your data, when you need to aggregate data, when you need to do some kind of feature engineering um, at scale, you're going to use EMR to do it and probably Spark. Okay? So um, sure, you can actually train machine learning jobs on Hadoop and, and Spark per se. But usually, these, uh, these pieces of uh, uh, these services will be used for data cleaning and data preparation prior to uh, deep learning. Okay? So SageMaker, uh, well, SageMaker, let me just say a word about this one. But again, we have a full session. SageMaker aims at simplifying your machine learning workflows. Okay? So we provide you one sing with one single environment that lets you go from experimentation to training to deployment right? in, one, in one go okay? um, using Jupyter Notebooks and using the tools that you like. Okay? Um, you have some built-in algorithms. I mentioned a few already, but there are more. Uh, you can also use uh, TensorFlow, your own TensorFlow code. You could use MXNet code. You could use PyTorch code. Um, you, know, you could bring your own training code. You could bring your own models and deploy them only, right? Do away with the training. Just do the deployment part. There are many different ways to use SageMaker. And we'll see, we'll see this in the, in the session today. All right? Um, <coughs> and I just want to say a word about the lower layer, um, a, w a few months ago, we launched the P3 instances. Um, so it's a new family of GPU instances uh, based on the latest uh, NVIDIA GPU, uh, which is the most powerful available now. Um, and I believe we're still the only cloud to have them available. Um, these are uh, quite a bit faster than the previous generation of instances, the P2 instances. And so generally, you get better, uh, a better uh, um, a cost performance ratio with P3. So if you're using P2 uh, today, please, please upgrade to P3. Uh, you will get more bang for the buck and, uh, and much shorter training times. Okay. We also uh, help you get started quicker uh, with the deep learning uh, AMI. So this AMI is pre-installed with everything you need for deep learning, uh, the NVIDIA drivers, all the deep learning libraries, uh, all the Python tools that you need. So it, it's, it's the reasonable way <laughs> to do it, right? If you want to fire up an EC2 instance and install everything from scratch, be my guest. And uh, four hours later, you will say, man, I should have tried the deep learning AMI, right? 
Julian was right on that one. So trust me, uh, it's, it's free to use. You only pay for the instance itself. So there's, I don't think there's any reason not to use it. Uh, deep lens, again, if the demo gods are with me, uh, the last session of the day will uh, have a live demo of deep lens. And hopefully we'll finally get to do silly stuff with AI. Uh, it's a cool device. It, it's, uh, it's a developer device for basically education and, and to let you guys uh, get your hands dirty on deep learning with a real device, do some video recognition, uh, use the pre-trained models or build and train your own models and just generally you know, have fun with it. So it's pretty cool. You can pre-order it uh, from the Amazon website uh, and uh, I'll show you that later. The, the, last one, the last one thing I wanna say is we also launched a new initiative. It's not a service this time. It's really an initiative. It's called the ML Lab. And uh, this is really um, a way for companies who want to get started on AI but who feel they don't have the right skills or maybe you know, they don't know how to frame the problem. It's the way for them to get access to Amazon experts um, and, and talk to them and, uh, and have them guide you through uh, the early steps of your machine learning process. Okay, so it's consulting if you'd like, but consulting the AWS way. So pragmatic, result oriented, and you know, uh, gets you on the right track so that you, know, you can be autonomous and, and do the work, okay? So uh, please get in touch if, you, if you're interested. Uh, we already have customers working with us on this, like Johnson & Johnson and Toyota and more. Okay, so it's a, it's a very popular... Uh... Tesla is not working with you, eh? Sorry? Tesla. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I don't know all of them. You have millions of customers. So it probably is, yeah. Okay, so in summary, right? That's a lot of stuff, but uh, as you can see, you know, it's a, it's a big family picture. Uh, so just as a reminder, three levels, uh, three layers, a high level layer for application services, simple APIs, call them, get results, most of the time in real time. Yes, all of it is based on fancy deep learning, but it's a black box. You don't need to know, you don't wanna know. <laughs> you just wanna get results pay as you go, do it the AWS way, right? Um, and I would suggest that, you know, whenever you're trying to solve a business problem, please take a look at those first because they will let you go super fast and, you know, there's hardly no, hardly no code to write. So this is the right place to start. Maybe your problem doesn't yet work very well with, with one of those services. So first of all, let us know. Please send us feedback. If you're missing features, let us know. Get in touch. Yell on Twitter, you know, hashtag AWS wishlist. Uh, yell at your uh, AWS representative. Yell at me, too. I got, it's part of my job description. But let us know what you don't like, what's missing, okay? And then, while we add it, uh, you can work with the platform services, like SageMaker that you will see later today, or Amazon EMR, to build a more custom model on your data set, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And at the lowest level, of course, uh, you can rely on our instances, CPU-based, GPU-based, P3 for maximum training performance, uh, C5 probably for uh, best uh, cost performance ratio on, on prediction. Uh, we'll get back to that later. And of course, you can use any of those open source libraries. Uh, and I would strongly recommend that you do that in the context of the deep learning AMI, because it's gonna save you so much time and so much frustration trying to get all those moving parts right, okay? Uh, well, I think that's it for the first session. So uh, a lot of stuff, uh, and, and the message here, as you can see, is we try to give you as many options as possible. So high level stuff, easy, super fast to use, um, um, no expertise required, or you know, going down to the lower levels, uh, a little more expertise is required, but as you will see in the SageMaker session, we can help, help can actually help with that too, and bringing built-in algos and easy ways for you to, uh, to train and deploy on managed infrastructure. Okay, so now it's up to you. Uh, you have to go and build stuff. Uh, so I'm done with this session. I wanna thank you for listening so far. Probably you already need coffee by now. Uh, and uh, in the next session, we're gonna dive into deep learning and, uh, and MXNet, and we're gonna start seeing some code and some demos 
And remember, the next one is going to be chatbots with Jan. Right? Don't miss that. It's great. Uh, afterwards, after lunch, we'll go into SageMaker. So that's zero slides and only code. And then deep lens and whatever works. All right? OK, well, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope to see you in the next session. Thank you. Um,